Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metropolis Radio. Today, we are looking at Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. This would be the first movie to not have James Cameron's involvement. He directed the first two movies, obviously, if you've been following along, or it is general knowledge. Uh, now, what a lot of people online, what a lot of people online, both regular people and online pundits have been claiming is that there has been no good Terminator movie since 1991 with the launch of Terminator 2 Judgment Day. All I want to explore is, is that even, is that assertion remotely accurate? Or is this movie overhated just because James Cameron wasn't involved? Now, before we get started, remember to follow the blog, metropolisradio.blogspot.com, where you can stay up to date on all Metropolis Radio uploads, no matter if they're exclusive to the platform that you are currently watching or listening to this on. Now, with that out of the way, let's look into Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. So before we tear into the movie and even look at the creative team, I actually want to look at the rights issue because there was a major rights issue going with Terminator 3. Uh, Carlico, the company who originally owned 50% of the rights to the Terminator franchise, declared bankruptcy in 1995. Now, they had always planned to do a third movie, and they were expecting to get it done within five to seven years of Terminator 2's release. Now, with Carlico declaring bankruptcy, their film library was put up for auction. James Cameron at the time wanted to do a third movie, but with Fox. His amusement park ride Terminator 2 3D Battle Across Time did did well and it reunited the cast of Terminator 2 and he began writing a script for his own Terminator 3 in 1996. Now to go back a little further, on November 10th, 1995, Carlico's assets were set to sold were set to be sold via a liquidation auction. 20th Century Fox that day put a bid in for $50 million, and that's not just for the Terminator rights, but for their entire library. Uh, now, Canal Plus would then put in a counteroffer for $58 million. Canal Plus's offer did not include the Carlico sequel films. Uh, Fox was unwilling to match Canal Plus's bid or even exceed it, so the rights were, ul were ultimately were set to be auctioned off through the U.S. Bankruptcy Court, where Fox intended to purchase the rights from. Now, Terminator 3 at this time would have Arnold Schwarzenegger return along with Linda Hamilton, reprising her role as Sarah Connor, uh, during 1997, Fox spent nine months negotiating with James Cameron, Schwarzenegger, and Gail Ann Hurd, uh, the latter being for her share of the Terminator rights. Uh, for those who don't know, James Cameron sold Gail Ann Hurd his share of the Terminator rights for $1 before the first movie even came out in theaters, and that's how she held 50% of the Terminator rights. Uh, Fox intended to make Terminator 3 with a budget of $95 million, and that's a slightly smaller budget than what Terminator 2 was made with at the time. However, it was determined that the movie couldn't come in on budget after the acquisition of the Carlico film rights, as well as Schwarzenegger wanting a $25 million salary. And at one point in 1997, Arnold suggested to James Cameron that they just straight up buy the rights back to the Terminator franchise. However, James Cameron was not interested in the idea and just wanted to let Fox handle the rights, now, Arnold said about Fox, quote, and I'm not going to try to do my Arnold impression here because it would be way too long and I'd butcher it. Only later did I learn they were making these ridiculous lowball offers like $750,000. We could have owned this ourselves, but Jim, won Jim didn't want to be in that business. Dimension Films, subsidiary of Miramax at the time, wanted to buy the rights. They wanted to buy the rights from Gail Ann Hurd and Carlico, effectively owning 100% of the Terminator franchise at that point. However, a judge ruled against an earlier motion which stated that only an established studio should be allowed to bid for the Carlico rights. And this is where Andrew Givana steps in. In September 1997, Cameron invited Vanna and Mario Cassar to see an early edit of his next film, Titanic. And that's where they learned that the Terminator rights were still up for sale. Vanna, after that, had been quietly negotiating with the bankruptcy courts to acquire the rights for himself and Kassar. Vanna and Kassar wanted to start a new production company together, and they wanted Terminator 3 as its debut film. Uh, Vanna signed an agreement to purchase the rights at $7.5 million. Uh, Bill Mechanic, the chairman of Fox Filmed Entertainment, was furious when he found out about Vanna's agreement after spending months and months negotiating with Jim Cameron, Gail Ann Hurd, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Cameron was very upset as well, as he had no idea of Vanna's intentions 
to even buy the rights to the Terminator franchise, uh, Miramax dropped out of the auction when Vanna raised his bid to $8 million. Uh, and in October of 1997, Fox's budgetary concerns over Terminator 3 and James Cameron's post-production issues on Titanic led them both to abandoning the Terminator project and to not pursue the rights anymore. Uh, Mechanic did ask Cameron if he wanted Fox to outbid Vanna, and Cameron just said no. He didn't want to be involved in the project anymore. Cameron gave Gail Ann Hurd and Schwarzenegger his blessing to do another Terminator movie without him. Now, initially, Arnold didn't want to do it without James Cameron, and Arnold even initially declined the offer to return for Terminator 3 later on. Uh, James Cameron did actually consider buying the rights back himself through his company, Lightstorm Entertainment, back in the, you know, back in the same time, 97, 98. But after the costs of acquiring the rights and paying Schwarzenegger to reprise the role, uh, Terminator 3, it would cost him roughly around $100 million to just reacquire the rights and get Terminator 3 on, on track. And it wasn't until 2003 when James Cameron made the claim that he told the story he wanted to tell with the first two movies. In my opinion, he said that because he, did, because he didn't want to get the rights back to the Terminator for himself, and that led to one of his friends, Andrew Vanna, to buy the rights right out from under him, which led to the deterioration of their friendship. And Vanna purchased the other 50% of the rights from Gail Ann Hurd for $8 million back in March of 98. Now, Gail Ann Hurd did initially oppose to Andrew Vanna from buying the rights, and she tried to convince James Cameron to buy them, but he refused yet again. According to Vanna, Cameron was upset about the rights being sold, later saying, quote, What difference does it make to Jim who's financing the movie, a studio or us? His deal would have been the same. Arnold tried to convince Jim over a long period of time to do the film. Arnold felt very loyal, end quote. Vanna said that Cameron, quote, felt like we stole his baby, even though we're the ones who put it together last time round. So we felt that this was kind of strange, and then we went on to just do it ourselves. So yes, James Cameron was offered multiple times to, you know, reacquire the rights and even have Fox reacquire the rights for him, but he turned it down every single time. Now let's get on and look at the actual Terminator 3, and we're going to obviously start with the creative team. Now this movie would be directed by Jonathan Mosto. Now his directing and credits include movies such as Breakdown with Kurt Russell and J.T. Walsh, U571 with Matthew McConaughey and John Bon Jovi, Surrogates with Bruce Willis, and The Hunter's Prayer with Sam Worthington. And now we're going to look at the writers of this movie. The first set of writers are a writing duo, and that would be John Broncato and Michael Ferris. Uh, a, writing duo, a writing duo responsible for writing other movies such as Into the Sun with Anthony Michael Hall, The Net with Sandra, Bullitt, with Sandra, Sandra Bullock, uh, The Game with Michael Douglas, Catwoman with Halle Berry, Surrogates with Bruce Willis, and The Hunter's Prayer with Sam Worthington. And the last writer on this movie was Teddy Serafian. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the name. I'm only reading it. I'm not hearing it. Uh, there aren't many writing credits to his name. The only movies that he wrote that you might be familiar with are The Road Killers with Christopher Lambert and David Arquette and Tank Girl with Lori Petty. Now let's move on to the character analysis portion of this episode. And we're going to start with Arnold Schwarzenegger as, as Terminator. Just like in Terminator 2, Arnold is playing a completely different character. He's not the same T-101 from Terminator 2 because he died. And he's not the same Terminator that was in the, Terminator, that was in the first Terminator movie because he died. In this movie, he's not sent back in time to protect John Connor. He's sent back to protect Kate Brewster and to locate John Connor. It's revealed later in the movie that this, ter that this Terminator was used to kill John Connor in the future as a result of the same model of Terminator protecting him when he was a preteen in Terminator 2, thus lulling jo John Connor into a false sense of security before inevitably killing him. Uh, then we have Nick Stahl as John Connor. Now, John Connor in this movie isn't the same John Connor from Terminator 2. In this movie, he decides to live off the grid so that no one could track him down. No phone, no address, no motor car. And as a result of Skynet not being able to find John Connor in the past, they sent a Terminator back in time to kill his lieutenants instead. Uh, then we get Claire Danes as Kate Brewster. Uh, during the future war with the machines, she would not only be one of his lieutenants, but also his wife. 
Now, during the movie, the TX wants to kill her because she's on a mission to kill all of the lieutenants, as I brought up. Now, most of the movie, she just gets kidnapped and thrown into the back of a truck. Uh, the T-101's mission is to make sure that she and John Connor basically survive Judgment Day so that they can play out their roles in the future war of man versus machine. Then we have David Andrews as Robert Brewster. Now, a lot of this movie revolves around him. Uh, he works for the Air Force in the Special Weapons Divi Division, basically the top secret shit. And I'll get more into it with the narrative portion of this episode. And finally, we have Kristana Locken as the TX. Oh, Kristana Locken from the early 2000s. Uh, she's the Terminator in this movie, and she is a quote-unquote anti-Terminator Terminator. It does make sense from a logical standpoint, though, that if the human resistance keeps capturing these Terminators to send back in time to protect John Connor and his lieutenants, then it makes sense that Skynet would create a model of Terminator that can battle other Terminators. Now let's move on to the narrative analysis portion of this episode. Now in this movie, the events have obviously changed. Judgment Day didn't happen in 1997. In this movie, Judgment Day happens the day that Arnold's Terminator is sent back. All Arnold's Terminator is doing in this movie is making sure that John Connor and Kate Brewster survive Judgment Day. Arnold telling John Connor, quote, Judgment Day is inevitable. Now, as I said in the character portion of this episode, Robert Brewster plays an important role in this movie. In this movie, there's a computer virus sweeping everything from government computers to personal computers to POS systems. Uh, the Air Force wants to deploy Skynet to basically quash the virus like a bug. And by the end of the movie, feeling that there was no other option, Robert Brewster released Skynet, thus giving Skynet free reign to do whatever the fuck it wanted to do. So instead of the microprocessor taking over the world from Terminator 2, it's now a piece of decentralized software that got into all computers. Now, in my opinion, this works because computers were way more advanced in the early 2000s than they ever were back in 1991. I mean, that's like comparing apples to oranges here. Now, I argue that this movie not only fixes the logical problem with Terminator 2, it also makes the first Terminator that much more important. The first Terminator movie is no longer just a slasher movie with guns. Kyle Reese had to go back to 1984 to get Sarah Connor pregnant with John Connor. As I stated in my Terminator 2 retrospective, if Judgment Day were successfully prevented, then there would be no reason for John Connor to exist. In this movie, Judgment Day does happen. Hence why John Connor still exists at the end of, the, at the end of this movie. Robert Brewster lies to John and Kate about shutting Skynet down and telling them that they, that they have to go to Crystal Peak in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Uh, when they get there, they find out that it was a presidential doomsday bunker that was obviously constructed during the Cold War. And because Judgment Day happened and John Connor, along with Kate Brewster, survived it, now there's a reason for John Connor's existence. In closing, there's only one way for this movie to end. Given the title Rise of the Machines, Judgment Day needed to happen. If the filmmakers kept putting it off, then that would have just been lazy writing. Now let's take a look at how this movie was received. This movie has a Rotten Tomato score of 69% based on 205 critic reviews with the critics consensus being quote, although T3 never reaches the heights of the second movie, it is a welcome addition to the Terminator franchise. And this movie has an audience score of 46% based on 441,569 audience reviews. And this movie on, has a Metacritic score of 66 based on 41 critic reviews and a user score of 7.4 out of 10 based on 719 ratings. And this movie sits on IMDb at 6.3 out of 10 based on 371,795 reviews. Now this movie was made on a budget of $200 million. Now if we adjust it for inflation in 2020 dollars, that is a budget of $281,631,521.74. And the movie grossed $433,371,112 worldwide. Now, if we adjust that for inflation $2020, that is a worldwide gross of $610,254,828.75. Now, this movie made a little less than Terminator 2, but what made this movie not profitable was its $200 million budget. Had it been made for the $100 million that T2 was made on, and, or the $95 million that Fox wanted to make the original Terminator 3 on, 
this would have been very profitable for you know Andrew Vanna, and it would have been very profitable in the initial theatrical run. Now, James Cameron described the film as, quote, in one word, great. But shortly after the movie, the, this was shortly after the movie released initially. He didn't start to slam the movie until after Terminator Salvation came out when he states something to the effect of that the first two movies were better than either of the latter films, blah, 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 blah. This movie was a necessary entry into the Terminator series. As I stated, not only did it fix the problems with Terminator 2, it also made the first Terminator movie that much more important retroactively. Now, I've brought up that this series of movies plays, the, plays with the ideas of time travel as you see them in 12 Monkeys. I would argue that the time travel aspect is a blend of Back to the Future with 12 Monkeys. 12 Monkeys in the sense that something in the past created the present that allows the time travel to the past exist. The Back to the Future stuff comes in when you realize that the course of the future war with man versus machine has significantly been altered because of the events of Terminator 2 and Terminator 3. And I'll end the episode off with this. When this movie came out, this was not slammed for quote-unquote destroying Terminator 2's legacy. You can't destroy something that's already fundamentally flawed. What a sequel can hope to do is fix those flaws retroactively that way those flaws can be explained away. For any and all James Cameron fanboys, if James Cameron was truly done with the Terminator series, then he wouldn't have left the door open for a third movie at the end of Terminator 2. The fact that John Connor did not disappear at the end of Terminator 2 proves that Judgment Day was not prevented, it was merely just delayed.